you know, it comes a point where you do this for such a long time, it becomes an integral part of you. And there's no separation between you and what you do in a way. Hello and welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 628. And my guest today is Sensei Matthew Ubertini. I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host here for the show where everything we do is in support of traditional martial arts. If you want to know why we do what we do and go deeper on all the things that we do, go to whistlekick.com. It's our online home, and it's also the easiest place to find our products. Now, the code PODCAST15 is going to get you 15% off, and the show has its own website. It's whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And if you haven't been over there in a while, you should probably go check it out. We've got really a lot of stuff going on for each episode. We've got every episode up there. We embed the video, the the YouTube link for the video episodes. We drop the photos and videos and social media links. We really try to make it easy for you to get everything you want related to the episode. Transcripts go up there eventually. They they lag a little bit for the episodes, but we, we get them up as quick as we can. And you can also sign up for the newsletter. Now, the show itself comes out twice a week. We bring you an interview episode on Mondays and uh, usually a topic-driven episode for Thursdays. And why do we do it? Well, we're looking to connect, educate, and entertain traditional martial artists throughout the world, regardless of style, regardless of age, rank, any of that. We're just, we're, we're trying to get everyone to realize that we've got more that connects us than divides us. And I think that's a pretty timely message. If you want to support that work, here are a few things you could do. You could buy some. You could grab a book on Amazon. You could tell a friend about what we're doing. You could pick up one of our programs at whistlekickprograms.com. Or you could support the Patreon, p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com slash whistlekick. You're going to get exclusive content at Patreon. And if, if you go over there, you get all the details because we give you a bunch of different stuff and you've got different options, different price tiers. You get free merch that we threw in. That was a revision that we didn't, we didn't have the prices. Add the prices. What does that, that, that even mean? We didn't raise the prices. There we go. It's been a long day. It's been a great day recording episodes. And speaking of that, this is the last episode that I recorded today. And it was a doozy. Had a lot of fun. Different guests bring different energy. And some of them really keep me working. I mean, I've, I, they're, 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 they're fast. They're talking about a lot of different stuff and they're really keeping me on my toes. And today's episode was one of those. Matt was a wonderful guest and we had some really good conversation after the show too. We've got a lot in common and I think you're going to hear that come through in the show. He's a really thoughtful martial artist and there's a lot of humility and and the combination of the two led to some really good discussion and I hope that you enjoy it. Hey there, how are you? Hey Jeremy, how are you? I'm doing great, thanks. Awesome. And yourself? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me on. Hey, thanks for being on. Thanks for doing this. Absolutely. You are episode number four that I'm recording today. Ah. So I've been challenging myself with this first question because historically I asked this first question. I find, I try to find new and creative ways to say, how'd you start training? Yeah, yeah. And I've been challenging myself today to ask a different question. And and I've, I've managed to ask a few different questions. Hmm. So. Here's one that I often close with, but I'm going to open with it and we'll run from this. Mm. If you could go back to your first day of training and get, Mm. let's say, 30 seconds with Mm -hmm. former younger you, day one, before you actually step foot training, you're about to start training. Yeah. And you can offer some some words of wisdom or advice or something. What would you tell yourself? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, I, I mean, I started training when I was like six or seven, I think. So, so you talk about uh, Legos. Yeah, actually, my, my it's funny. My Zoom app is like yelling at me right now. Um, yeah, Legos, definitely. Like, you know, keep, keep building that. Um, <laughs> you know, if I went back, I would say I give myself a lot of advice, actually. Um, don't stop. Just keep going. Just keep going. Because, you know, in your younger years, you know how it is. You know, you're into different sports. You do this for a couple of years, you're out, you come back a year later and you're doing it again. And and then eventually, you know, some people continue and some people stop, you know. Um, so I, th- I think that would be the best advice outside of, you know, life advice in general. Um, going back to my, to, to when, I, when I began training around that age. So definitely. 
it's interesting how often that advice that just keep going yeah surfaces mm-hmm. and it's not just a martial arts thing right like <clears throat> if you if you look at kind of the i don't know if you follow a lot of social media i do you know professionally and personally mm-hmm. there are a lot of people saying this in in different ways yeah you know you've got you've got time you know this gary vaynerchuk's big thing right now he's like it doesn't matter how old you are you still have time yeah you don't have to panic yeah. just find a thing and keep keep plugging along and, and just keep going at it. you know and, and i think a lot of times you know we we do and we start training you know especially when we're young you know because of our parents or you know our friends got into it and uh you know we all i i, I mean i remember you know i mean this is this is upwards almost geez you know 30 years ago of you know get up my friends get on our bicycles and go down to the local dojo and uh you know but at that time you know you're doing the the regular you know wherever you are, you know, dojo, whether it be, you know, karate or judo or whatever was around your block, you know, whatever it was. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it is fascinating to me how many people stop training. Hmm. Like most people who start training, stop training. Yeah. I mean, statistically, anybody who spent more than a month in a martial arts school knows that most people drop out. Mm -hmm. And that the majority of those people regret it. They, 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 I, I think you're, you know, and I hear that a lot. I hear that a lot from students and they say, Oh, I wish I didn't stop training. Um, you know, this stuff sucks. You know, <laughs> a lot of the time. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I understand why people stop, you know? Um, and then, you know, people regret because they, they I think they think and they look back like, Oh, well, you know, I could have been here or there. And, you know, whatever, you know, goal they kind of built up in their own mind to kind of, kind of reach for, you know, but, um, yeah, you know, and we do have people that come back after so many years and, and continue to train, but, you know, their bodies are, are, you know, breaking down or, you know, they can't do what they physically thought that they could do. And then you, then you either, they're going to stick with it or they're gone within a month, you know, so it depends. Yeah. Yeah. Those expectations yeah. Really kind of bite them. Yeah. You know, I, I started training when I was six and I trained until I was 14 yeah, and yeah. now I'm 42 and I've been completely inactive <laughs> exactly. since I got out of college. Yeah. I'm just going to pick up where I left off yeah. and anything less than a completely lateral slide over the last 28 years <laughs> will be viewed as failure. Of course. And, 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 and you got to, and you, but you know what they say? You got to wonder if they're setting themselves up for failure. So yeah. they have a justification for, Oh, well, you know, I guess I don't have to do this. I don't do that. I'm like, oh, I don't want to get hurt. But you know what they say? Like, you, you never get hurt in the dojo. You know, you get hurt somewhere else. Yeah. It's, so. always, it's always that other stuff. Yeah. It's other stuff. Or if it's in the dojo, it's it's ego. Absolutely. If we get hurt, any anytime I've been hurt training, yeah. it's been ego. Absolutely. Absolutely. Completely agree with you. Yeah. So Very six, funny. you started at six. I, I was it so. your idea or was it your parents' idea? No, I know. I, I think... I think they try to get me into a bunch of different stuff. I was you know, doing soccer, baseball, you know, the usual stuff everybody, every kid does. And, um, and I mean, and, and again, I'm, you know, in preparation for, you know, our call, um, you know, I was just kind of reminiscing a little bit, you know, going kind of back to, you know, the early years and which I forgot, like I forget so you forget so much. And, um, I, I remember my father taking me to a few different schools and um and I remember walking in seeing all the you know the colored belts and everybody doing some you know some crazy stuff and I was like, Wow, this is really cool, you know. And um eventually, you know, found the place and you know, did that for a few years and then found another teacher and did that as, as any kid would do, you know, switch over to go with your friends, go to their place and but going back to your first question, you know, you got to keep, got to keep doing it. Got to keep moving. Yeah. Have you been training perpetually since you were six? Um, I've been doing something since I was six. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, early years we did, you know, the, the jujitsu or the Goshen jitsu or more correctly, you know, classify it is, you know, self-defense based on Japanese jujitsu, karate and judo. Um, you know, on Long Island, you know, specifically, and it's all great stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of different teachers, you know, talk about types type of stuff or variations of it. 
And, uh, you know, I did that, you know, when I, when I wrestled after that, you know, came back, did it again, wrestled, you know, you know through high school, um, junior high school. So I was always doing something. I don't think I got really super serious until maybe senior year of high school, maybe beginning of college, maybe freshman mm-hmm. year of college. Yeah. From what I can remember. But, um, and then from then, yeah, it's been perpetual. Let it up. That's not a typical path. You know, when we think about 12, 13, 15, 16 year olds, if they're not really into something, they, they don't do it unless they have to. Yeah. Was it, was it something your, your, your parents forced you to do? No, I don't think they did. I think they just gave me kind of hung out. Yeah. I think they just kind of gave me, you know, if you like it, you know, do it. If you don't like it, don't do it. No, I, I, I'm now with my children, I'm the other way around. I'm like, no, you got to continue to do it. You, you can't stop. <laughs> uh, you know, I know, I mean, thank God my kids love still sports, but if they didn't, I'd be like, no, you got to go. Um, like I remember waking up on a Saturday morning and my dad's like, you want to go to the dojo? I'm like, no, he's like, okay. You know, he probably didn't want to take me. Uh, that's what it really probably came down to. Um, but yeah, I mean, for the most part, I, I think that, that, uh, you know, I, 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 I always had a, like a little bit of a fascination with, with Japanese culture when I was young, when I was young. And, um, I think being around that was, was very interesting. Um, where did that fascination come from? I don't know. I really don't know. I think, you know, I picked up some, you know, black belt magazine, you know, and and I just, I just loved reading about, you know, all the different martial artists and, uh, you know, I I think that's what really, it was just interesting to me. I I don't think there was any, you know, cartoon. I know, you know, you interviewed uh, my, uh, one of my colleagues, Matt King and, uh, I know he was into the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and that's what kind of yeah. got him going. And, and uh, you know, I, I don't think there was anything specific. I think it was more the culture, believe it or not, that, 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 hmm. that got me really interested so early in, in the training, you know. Wow. Yeah, it, it's, it's interesting. You know, sometimes we don't know why something resonates with us. Yeah, you know, it, yeah. The, the human psyche is so complex and multifaceted. That- Absolutely. You know, we we probably need a team of PhDs to dig this one <laughs> exactly. out. But that's, that's all right. So, what did what did becoming more serious your senior year of high school, early college? What what did that look like? If we, if we watched that transition, what would we mm. see? Um, I think I wanted to become a part of something greater. Um, I think that it was, and again, this is going back to to the culture thing. Um. You know, around that time, believe it or not, uh, I got very into like Japanese swords, like antique Japanese swords. I was very infatuated with the with the samurai and uh, and, I, I, and Zen culture, and and uh, I, I always found that quite interesting. And even in college, I took you know tons of courses in, in uh, you know Asian philosophy and um, anything that I can kind of get my hands on, and. Uh, or, or attend, believe it or not. And uh, I think that I just kind of wanted to really just settle down. And, and listen, you know, at that age, you're 18, 17, 18, 19 years old. Dude, what do you want to, you know, it's, it's ego. It's, you know, you want to be the strongest. You want to, you know, get out there and, you know, compete and, and just, just, just do all that type of stuff. And uh, I think that's what drove me in those, in that, in that time. Um, and uh, believe it or not, you know, my friendships that I've developed from that period of time are still, I still hold true to this day, you know, and, you know, I'm 40, I'll be 42 in a few days. And, uh, I think that it was that interest first and really wanting to get serious with it and then developing friendships within the dojo that, you know, kind of perpetuated that constant, you know, three times, four times a week type of training. And, um, doing that you know until either people make this career decisions and stop or go like me that just keeps going you know so <laughs> when did you know you wanted that to keep going mm. I, I i couldn't get enough of it um mm. you know I, I i just i just i loved the physicality of it i love the philosophy of it uh, um and albeit you know i was training with you know all American, you know, arts or Japanese derived American arts. And, you know, it was, I think it was the interest of wanting to learn more, learn more, learn more, get back closer to the source, closer to the source. And, um, you know, 
I was lucky enough to, you know, come in contact with, you know, teachers that, that had contacts to, you know, Japanese teachers or, um, you know, really just, yeah, my, I had a goal for a while to go to Japan and train Japan. And, you know, I was luckily, luckily enough to do that at, at one time. Um, and, uh, I think that took me into, you know, continuing, you know, jujitsu and karate and diving into Japanese swordsmanship and, you know, expanding my interest in Japanese swords. Um, so I, I think that it's multifaceted in regards to, you know, what keeps you going, what got you really serious. So I think there, there comes a time when you get older, you know, you're just like, wow, this is I really want to explore this. You know, you have means to do it and, uh, and you know, you do it. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I get it. I totally get it. I think that multifaceted, I think that's, that's so important. It's something that most martial arts school owners don't seem to grasp. Mm. Like we're going to have the, the best instruction. Yeah. Or we're going to have the cleanest, nicest facility. Yeah. Or it's like, how about, and yeah. How about you stack as many of those reasons for people to train yeah. as possible? Yeah. You know, give them a social dynamic, give them different training, give them, you know, fun environments, yeah. get them have social events. You know, the more you can stack that, the more people work through, because, you know, we're at this interesting time. And, and, and I, I wonder if you had any of these, I certainly had these moments in my training where it would have been easier to put it down. Mm. And when, when I, when I was a kid, you know, my, I'm thankful for this. My mother didn't let me. Mm. And as an adult, there were times where I thought about putting it down for mm -hmm. various reasons, time or stress, or, you know, I, I, I got to fight with somebody at the dojo, or, you know, whatever it was. Yeah, sure, like, oh, sure. Maybe, maybe I need to put this down. Sure. And just remembering that, yeah, there's this aspect that might not be going right, but because I had all this stacked set of reasons, mm -hmm. I couldn't. Did you have times where you thought about putting it down, but other elements kept you in? I think, I think that was yesterday. I'm pretty sure. Really? Okay. <laughs> Can't get more no, timely than that. Let's do it. Uh, <laughs> um, you know what? That, that's a really, that's a really great question. Um, and I think this affects, you know, every martial artist, Roka, um, you know, martial arts school owner. Um, it's always easier to do something else. And, uh, you know, I, I think that part of training, and I tell this to my students all the time, they said, you know, when people start, they love it. They love it. They get, they get enthralled with it, you know. And then yeah, a month later or three years later, they're tired of it. You know, they're tired of the, the, the pain. They're tired of sweating. They're tired of whatever, whatever it might be. And then they let go of it. But I tell them all, like, listen, you're going to go through waves of, of, of training. Um, you know, you're going to go on this proverbial, you know, roller coaster. And, and some days you're going to love it. Some days you're going to hate it. But the training um, is showing up and going, but not only going for you, but going for other people, going for the, 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 your colleagues that you train with, going for your teachers. Um, you know, uh, when I was younger, I think that I showed up for the knowledge um, and for my friends and for the guys that I was training with. Because they would say, oh, man, I don't have anybody, you know, to train with today. Or, you know, oh, if you don't come, then, you know, we're not going to be able to train really hard. Whatever it might be. Um, so I, I think that burnout happens a lot. Um, but I think that's part of the training. It's part of the, you know, seven times down, eight times up. And uh, I, I think that everybody needs to do that and, and understand that. Um yeah, listen, a lot of people try Budo to, you know, see what it's about, see if they enjoy it. They want to learn self-defense. They want to learn how to kick and punch. They want to learn how to grapple, you know, whatever, whatever it might be. Um, but showing up every class or as many classes as you, you know, physically can um, is the most important. And training through those rough times is, is, uh, is, is just as difficult, but also just as rewarding. And, um, I mean, let's look at COVID. I'm sure this has affected you as well as, uh, you yeah. know, I'm teaching zoom classes, you know, cause we couldn't meet and, you know, I'm sitting upstairs with my kids and, you know, hanging out, having dinner. And then I got to go down 20 minutes later to go teach and 
do, do I want to do that? You know, like I could do a million other things right now, but no, no, I, I do because it's part of the training. And more importantly, students are there, they show up, they want to learn. So that's what continues to drive me to train and, and, uh, you know, be there for each other. That's the most important thing. Mm. What we're really talking about here, we're getting to the essence of, of the why, you know, and our, and our why can change, but it sounds like you've spent some time really thinking about your why. Yeah. Um, is it something changed. you talk about with your students? Do you help them understand what their why is? Um, I, I think everybody's there for a different reason. Um, and I try to figure out what's best for them and the best way to teach them. Um, whether it's, you know, physical technique or they're there for their camaraderie, they're there. And I think that's an important part for every instructor is to be able to figure that out for their students. Like what are their needs? You know, they're showing up, they're giving you their, their time, um, because you're offering this thing, you know, whatever it might be. Um, you know, but in turn, you know, we're giving back to our teachers and continuing our traditions and, and I think this, this, this this constant um, you know, support on both sides. So yeah, I think that we have to find our students' needs and uh, try to help them adapt as, as best as possible. Um, you know, and this kind of brings me up, you know, I, I've been working, I've been actually, the dojo that I'm teaching at right now is, um, is really wonderful. And, uh, they, they have had a lot of uh, people with, uh, you know, physical disabilities and, uh, you know, they've worked with a lot of, you know, challenged, uh, individuals. And, uh, that's been probably the most rewarding is, uh, mm -hmm. is helping people that are, you know, physically unable to do some things, but to help them kind of find their why, you know, and, um, and that might be something is, you know, just having that camaraderie. Um, but I want to help them build stronger. I want to help them, you know, walk with, you know, their head up high and whatever that might be. That's the most important thing. That's my why, truthfully, uh, mm -hmm. especially now, especially now. The, I think you almost even said it this way. We, we, we did a show years ago on, I think we called it martial arts as service. The idea that participating in group instruction as, as student instructor, being there part of the mix, it's important. We all need each other. You know, an instructor without students is, is kind of irrelevant. Students sure. without an instructor aren't, aren't going to learn anything. And just this recognition that we we all need to collaborate for that. But you've also used some other language that makes me think your why is is really so much about other people and, and filling this role to support them in their progress, in their growth. Mm -hmm. And in my experience, when when that is the case, it's because there's been someone in their past, and in this case, in your past, who you really felt probably went above and beyond for your progress in yes, martial arts. Am I, am I right? Is Absol there somebody that uh, sticks uh, out? Absolutely. So, you know, I, I actually, you interviewed my teacher, Eric Johnstone. Um, and uh, I think, you know, a number of months ago. And, uh, you know, he, I came from, you know, out on Long Island, you know, learning with a bunch of different teachers over the years. And, uh, out of anybody that I've trained with, um, he, he really helped me find, you know, what, I, what I was really looking for. Um, and, you know, through his way of teaching, I've learned to help, you know, um, and that's helped me develop, you know, quite a bit in regards to my teaching ability and, and, and helping and, uh, you know, I guess, you know, in a way like a selflessness to help your students. So that influenced me tremendously. And, uh, that comes from, you know, our, our teachers that, you know, have run our systems and the same type of thing. You know, I, I've really been very blessed to have some really amazing people that have taught me and continue to teach me and help me. And, uh, you know, we can't be selfish with that. We have to give that back. So, uh, mm. that's where it really comes down to influencing the way, you know, I would teach and, and what, you know, I always ask the question, what would my teacher do? You know, how, 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 how would he help, you know, 
and then I extend that out to to our family, you know, especially uh, in our in our EI family, you know, our sort family. Um, you know, what what would they do? You know, what would our teachers do? And and I really I, I weigh that heavily because um, you know a, a reflection of me is a reflection of them, and that's very important. And doing the right thing is very important. So yeah. I like the way you put that. A reflection of me is a reflection of them. It's something that I I, I think it it's we think about it with the people we teach. We think about it. It's something I I don't have children, but I, I hear parents talk about it. You know, I know that my child, my student, is a reflection of me. And so people work really hard to to make sure that they're handing over good things, that they're yes. teaching, etc. But it doesn't always come back the other way. We don't always hear about it. I, I, I don't hear a seven-year-old say, you know, I'm not going to act out because I don't want, want to make my mom look bad. Yeah, right? yeah, like that yeah. doesn't happen. Sure. And I don't tend to hear martial arts students, at least not, in, not commonly, mm. say, I want to make my instructor proud. I don't mm. want to, I, I, I want to succeed at this competition or I want to sure. put in the time. Sure. I, I want to do well at my rank test. Mm. So where's that coming from for you? Mm. So I think you're asking me, you know, wh where are you seeing that in your students? Is that where you kind of get? Um, it's, it's a, uh, a general question. You can, w when I ask questions, you can respond to them pretty much mm. however you want. You know, it's uh it's, it's a lead off. So what I'm, what I'm hearing from you is uncommon in my experience. Mm. And there's an, there's an element there that I, I guess requires some introspection that maybe maybe is is not appropriate at this time because it's out of left field for you. And I apologize yeah, for that because no, no, everything I, I do is out of left field. But <laughs> is a, is there a, a point question. where where you said, you know, I've got to step up because I don't want to make my instructor look bad. Where did that, what would my instructor do come from? Mm, I think it's, I think it's, that's a good question. Um, I think it's a personal responsibility. I think it, we as as students need to be able to, you know, just portray what we do in the best light. So, and, and, and I really, you know, you talk about that reflection, that mirror, um, you know, the, the, the martial arts we study, and I study a choreo, um, you know, mostly, uh, and it's it's goes down twenty two generations, twenty two subsequent generations of people, uh, twenty two generations of knowledge uh, passed down from person to person. And um, with that, there's a lot of history. There's uh, you know thousands of men and women, um, hundreds and hundreds of years of, of of commitment to what they're doing. Um, so it's not so much me or my teacher or my teacher's teacher it's and it is and it is at the same time but it's the it's the history of that that we all carry you know um and you know i'm not ahead of anything you know whatsoever but it's each one of us has that holds that candle that flickering candle you know down that dark alleyway keeping that light on and um, I, I, it, it's highly important that that continues for the next 500 years, you know, in my mind, because mm -hmm. I've chosen that. This is, so because I've chosen that, my reflection has to reflect what my teacher has been taught and so forth and so on. And my actions dictate how my students will then pass that on to the next generation. And, you know, out of the hundreds of you know, people that I've taught, you know, throughout the, the decades, um, you know, there are a handful of really great students, great people who have become teachers themselves that are, that are now passing that along, you know. Um, but you have to be willing to learn. And that's it. You know, you have to open yourself to that. And part of that is to put yourself down, you know, um, in regards to your, your ego and uh, accept what's being shown to you and, and, and listen and learn, you know. So, yeah. You use the, the, the phrase, 
great instructors or good instructors. Mm. What makes someone a great instructor? Mm, good question. Um, I think that somebody needs to be number one, technically sound. Somebody that is representing their chosen art to be, you know, a, a, a representative of that art. Um, I think that you need to have um, an outgoing personality, somebody that's going to attract students. Um, I'm not saying that you need to have that, but I, I think it helps, especially in the beginning. Um, and I think you need to have compassion for, for others and, and, and to, try to, to try to seek to understand and try to understand you know, uh, and what they're about. And again, as we talked about before, finding their why. What's their why? So uh, I think those three things are, are highly important in the future. Mm. Absolutely. Let's switch gears. Sure. A, a little bit, a little bit here. You know, you're <clears throat> you're in New York City. Uh, in yeah, New York I, City. I used to live in New York City. Now I live on Long Island. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, still a rather populated area. Sure. Still a, a, a lot of options in mm -hmm. terms of martial arts. Sure. You could probably, in in a in a comfortable drive, sure, get access to anything. Yeah, you can. Why do you train what you train? Mm. Good question. Um, you know, I think everybody has a certain um, aptitude. You no, know, they 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 kind of gravitate towards certain things, whether they're grapplers or they're they're you know kickers or you know they so they might choose you know something like taekwondo or you know somebody who's into grappling might go to a BJJ or a judo school. And, uh, you know, for me, I've always had that fascination with, you know, the samurai. And it's always, you know, been something that I've you know, studied, you know, throughout the years. And uh, I've always been interested in, in, in the ancient, the old. Um, that's where I, you know, came into, you know, studying uh, Nihonpo, you know, Japanese swords. And uh, I think for me, the arts around that, have always interested me um but i like a lot of stuff i like buddha i, I like it all you know it's your uh and i appreciate it all uh i don't have time to do it all but i appreciate it all <laughs> um so you kind of have to good. yeah you kind of have to start you know whittling things down and choose something you know um to get really good if you really want to mm. really delve into things you know um but yeah, you know, I, I think that for me, it's, it's, it's around that culture and around the history um, and, that, and that thing that's, you know, something that's so old and older than you and, you know, generations of people before you. And, and uh, that's what I love. You know, that's what I love. Plus, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a grappler by nature and, and, a, and a swordsman, you know. So, yeah, without a doubt. Mm. The two probably don't come into play at the same time very often. They do. Tremendously. They do. Oh, of course. Sounds dangerous. Uh, it's a lot of fun. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Sometimes the danger is what makes it fun. Yeah. Uh, interestingly. So, uh, you know, if you look at like pre-war kendo, you know, and I've been doing kendo for, for you know, almost 20 years. And uh, if you look at pre-war kendo, uh, pre-war kendo had uh, compiled a lot, of, uh, a lot of grappling, a lot of throwing. Um, always involved in it. You could see stuff. You go into YouTube, check things out from you know from that time period. You'll see sweeps and throws, and you know people getting their men ripped off, and you know it's it's it's, it's pretty aggressive. Um, you know the core you, you know, especially in our in, in our style, Muso Jika Dinesh you. There is there is uh, tons of grappling involved, um, or you know you know basically things that lead to where the grappling could be. But uh, you have to think as a samurai art, you know, they studied a bunch of different arts. So, you know, grappling was, uh, you know, jujitsu specifically was a, it was a, an auxiliary um, uh, uh, study for them. You know, uh, primary weapons, you know, were spear, obviously, or your bow. And, uh, you know, with swordsmanship, you know, especially if, uh, if samurai lost you know, their weapon or uh, they would have to defend against swordsmen or they use short swords and daggers and, you know, minor weapons as well. There was always this armored grappling um, 
that was always inherent in everything they studied. So, yeah, I, it's, it was always intertwined, you know, without a doubt, of course. Yeah. I learned something. Yeah. Cool. I, I, I was just imagining, and, and, and maybe it's just the way I'm imagining grappling. You know, I'm imagining, you know, two people, you know, one pulling guard and the other one's got oh, a sword. Oh, yeah, yeah, no. You know, that's not going to that's not gonna work. But what you're saying makes, you know, makes all kinds of sense. Yeah, yeah, no. I, I was and, too limited in my in my definition. I understand. No, the, um, you know, and grappling arts in general, you know, judo, BJJ, kosen judo, um, you know, for anything from the Japanese side uh, or Brazilian side, um, they're fantastic, you know. They're, they're beautiful arts. They're, you could work them for, gen, you know, decades. Um you know, but my grappling is more focused on, you know, weapon-based arts, um, you know, the, the jiu-jitsu and uh, the Japanese jiu-jitsu. You know, they're you know, sometimes different, but they're, um, they're, uh, they're all awesome. Too. <laughs> the way you talk, uh, there, there's a reverence that comes through in your voice. Uh, hmm. are, are, you, are you aware of that? No. And do you feel that weight? No, I, 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 I'm not. A, no, I'm not. I'm not a. I, I, I just love what, what you know, what we, what, what I do, um, and uh, and I think that's what kind of you know keeps you going is the love for it, you know, and, and and just wanting to keep, you know, learning. You know, you can't stop learning. There's always something else to learn. You know, and uh, having that insatiable thirst is really important and. I hope when people train, you know, they don't stop because many do. Mm. Many stop learning. So let's say something happened. Let's say the things that you do, and, and not just the super specific things that you do, but the, the broader things. Let's say sword-based arts mm. and grappling, you know, traditional Japanese stand-up jiu-jitsu mm -hmm. sort of based arts are, however you want to think about it, they're they're made illegal or you know weirdly erased from the collective consciousness <laughs> yeah. or you're transported to an alternate universe where they don't exist mm. right and sure you get to you get to keep your memories of them but you don't get to train them mm. again what are you gonna do so what am i gonna give up that's what you're kind of what you're asking uh <laughs> well, how gonna are you gonna proceed what am i gonna forget about um do I get to pick one? <laughs> no, no, because you, you, you get to have the memories. Yeah, I get to have the you memories. Don't to, you don't get to train them in that in that codified way. Yeah. So I guess really the question is, what would you what would you switch into? What would I switch into? Um, hmm. Good question. Ah, I, I I'd find something. Um, you know, I'd probably completely out of martial arts completely you know going to mountain biking you know focusing on like some of my childhood interests um you know wh wh whatever you know i i think that you know it comes a point where you do this for such a long time it comes an integral part of you you know and there's no separation between you and what you do in a way you know uh but i i i don't think that it's necessarily always you know, the art or this, I, I think that it's the passion, the, the, uh, energy put into something can be transferred to something that might just, you know, at that moment, grab you. And, you know, I think that's something that you need some introspection, <laughs> but, mm. but, uh, you know, that, you know, the energy, you know, and that passion would transfer to, I'm sure something. All right, let, let's uh, let's switch gears. Let's... Sure. So the show is pretty story based. You know, mm. pretty much everything you've talked about is is based on segments of story. And one of the questions I used to ask, like in the early days of every episode, and it typically comes out organically, but I'm mm. I'm gonna I'm gonna leverage it in here. I'm gonna wedge it there. Stories. I love stories. It's mm. the root of of what we do here. Sure. If you were invited to speak to some group of martial artists, kind of like mm -hmm. you are, and you were brought up on stage and you're in front of a, a podium and the people organizing the event said, hey, I want you to open with your favorite martial arts story mm -hmm. from your time training. Mm -hmm. And then you can go on and you can lecture and, and tell them whatever else. What would that story be? And will you tell us now? 
My favorite martial arts story. Hmm. I mean, there's so there's so many, and I think they I think they're more social than anything. <laughs> and, and honestly, those are the best ones. Yeah, without a doubt. Um, you know what I really we we love? have heard some utterly ridiculous things over the years. <laughs> we have heard everything from you know the 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 ones that you might expect, like fights, yeah. to uh, surprises, yeah. to. Uh, disappointment mm. to life changing, uh, sure, powerfully sure. transitional things. Mm. I, I, I think, well, there's so many, really, there's so many. Um, I, I think that a lot of it, some of it can be life changing in regards to some of the talks you know, we get from our, from our seniors and our teachers that kind of make you, you know, rethink life in a way. Um, but uh, thinking back and, you know, kind of thinking of what I really enjoyed, um, that was kind of funny, you know. If I go back to some of my early kendo days, I remember, you know, after every practice, we'd always go to this uh, to this restaurant, you know, on a Saturday and uh, be with my teacher and the other students. And uh, I remember this particular, this one day that uh, a very senior teacher came and um, they'd, uh, we would eat and then everybody would get our fortune cookies at the end of the, uh, end, end of the meal. And uh, I remember this, t- this teacher, he was very quiet um, you wouldn't really expect much coming from him. And, uh, everybody opened their cookie and, you know, they'd read what it said. And somebody would always say, ah, the food is on today. Or, ah, he doesn't know, he doesn't know what he's talking about. So, um, uh, I remember this teacher opened it up and, and looked at it and, uh, he goes, mine's handwritten. And we're all looking at him like, wow, this is serious. It's handwritten. Wow. He goes, it says, uh, please help. I'm uh, stuck in a Chinese fortune cookie company and I can't, can't get out. <laughs> it was some crazy story that it came out with. And um, it, was, it was one of these, just these funny stories that just, you know, it, from a very unassuming person that, yeah. you know, and I always remember that. It was just a small, stupid joke, you know, but, you know, it, it was something that was... Yeah, we all, we, I mean, we all got to laugh about it, but, um, but, uh, the it, contrast, the contrast of someone who I, I suspect you hadn't seen be humorous before. No. And I probably just met him a couple of times and, uh, yeah, but it was, they were made it so funny was, I mean, I can't tell the joke. I, 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 I'll destroy the joke, but, um, he, uh, you know, it came from such an unassuming person that, uh, it was just, it was, it was fantastic. You know, it really was, it really was fantastic. Um, the main I'll, element I'll, of comedy is timing. Yeah, and I'll yeah. always remember that. You know, just just thinking of a you know a, a story that just kind of you'll never forget. Yeah, something like that. That's great. Yeah, yeah. I, I I love those. You know, the the w- I used to say your best story, and I don't think I asked it, you in that way. I think I said your favorite story. Yeah, yeah. Because when I when I, I learned early on when I asked people for their best story, they started being really judgmental. Mm. Because that story right there, what makes it enjoyable to us listening is that it was meaningful to you. Yeah, and we can was. relate, not if, if not necessarily to the story, but the meaning, yeah. uh, the meaning of that story, that context, et cetera. Yeah. But when I say your best story, you're like, I don't know if everybody's going to find this, you know. Yeah. And, and so, you know, that really becomes an important part of, of what we do here on the show. And I think it's a, a critical part of martial arts and how we relate to each other as martial arts, especially when we're crossing stylistic boundaries Mm -hmm. is the spirit of these things, the spirit with which we train, the spirit with which we teach, we learn. I can, I I could, you could throw me in a wushu class of Mm -hmm. which I have exactly 45 minutes of experience (laughs) and no, absolutely no Mandarin Cantonese, you know, I have a, a, a very mild amount of Japanese and slightly less Korean to work from. So you throw me in a wushu class taught traditionally, I'm not going to know anything that's going on, but I'm yeah. going to be able to follow along. Yeah, I'm going exactly. to be able to move my body. And I think that is such an important concept that we often forget about. Yeah. We're so busy splitting hairs sometimes that we forget that 
what we do is based on the spirit with which we're all doing something really pretty darn similar. Yes, and and it is, and you know, it was. I think there's an old Japanese book, not a Japanese book, but it was an old book on uh, Japanese martial arts, and everyone did something different. It was in, it was an interview. Um, you know, one was a Kido sensei, another one was a uh, Kendo sensei, another Ei sensei, Karate do, Shorinji Kenpo, like all these different arts. And the basic thing I took away from it was they're all reaching for their pinnacle. They're all reaching for their, their, you know, that, that perfection that will never be reached, you know, um, to your point, all the energy involved, you know, being able to, you know, kind of, you know, coexist with all these you know, different stylistic, you know, interpretations. Um, but the, the real truth of the matter is, you know, it's just that, you know, it, it, it's just, it's just being able to to express yourself as as in 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 the most sincere way as possible you know um and that's true for all those with all those teachers that i that i read about um you know all their their ideas of things it was it was all the same and to each of those teachers you know like for instance in kendo you know, the highest grade is you know hachidan you know eighth dan and uh, I remember the, the teacher said, uh, now that I've reached eighth dawn, I've reached the top of the mountain. But now when I look in the distance, I can see another mountain peak much higher. So I have to strive to reach that now, you know. And uh, that's part of the drive, you know, for everybody, whatever the style is. The style doesn't matter. You know, it's, 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 you know, does this make you a good person or not? You know, that's what it comes mm. to. Actually, I don't know if it makes you, I don't know if Buddha can make you a good person. I think that you're a good person or not, but, um, I think it helps. I think it helps. And I think I that, agree. yeah. And, and I think that people will, when they put everything into whatever chosen art that they do, um, it, it can make an already good person better. And help them contribute to you know society and help their students as we talked about before and um, that's the most that's the most important thing. Sure, I think I, I agree. I, I do. I completely agree. I, I want to talk about rank. Sure, and I want to talk about it in a way that that kind of it it, it bars from what you just illustrated this idea of reaching the top of the mountain, but then mm. realizing that there. are are other mountains and and some of them are taller and now you got to yes. go climb those. Yeah. I think we, we are potentially in this really interesting time in martial arts with respect to rank, because I, I think we can all agree that some people are, let me say it differently. We can all agree that we don't agree in how rank should be awarded. Mm, yeah. <laughs> and so my question is, do you think that will change? Does it does it reach some ridiculous point? Does it mm. reach some place where we kind of collectively say, oh, we need to make a change? And if so, what is that change? And if not, what are the consequences? Mm. Um, Frank's interesting. Um, it's either a blessing or a curse, you know, um, sometimes both. But, uh, I think that, you know, every organization has its own ranking structure, right? Um, and you can't compare one rank to another. Um, you know, the, the godan in karate is different from a godan somewhere else, um, even within the same style sometimes. Uh, I, I don't think it will ever stop um, in regards to some of the silliness that I've seen out there. Um, It'll just, it's been going on forever. You know, I know people, I see people on Facebook debate it constantly and, you know, fancy titles and, you know, get like that are given, you know, self given or given from some other organization that shouldn't be giving it anyway, whatever, whatnot. Um, I think it's up to the individual to really, you know, look for what in their mind is the most authentic um, or that has some very, you know, high grading standard uh and stick with that you know um 
Uh, I know that uh, it, it, it's a hard thing to really discuss because everybody's got their own thought process. And I'm not saying, you know, any of them are incorrect or wrong. Um, but truthfully, great outside of your own organization, in my mind, is really irrelevant. It's what can you do, you know? And uh, more importantly is what have you done for, for you know, your students? What are your students look like? You know? um, how do they act? So, um, you know, trying to change it or, you know, fix it or I, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> what, what, I'm, what I'm hearing is don't worry about it so much. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I, I think that's something that, you know, I listen, when we're all starting to train, everybody wants, you know, well, I want to, I want to show it on. Oh, I want to go down. I want, oh, I want this. I want that. Um, you know, the like BJJ is very, you know, belt oriented, you know, white, uh, blue, purple, you know, but they're, they're competitive grades. You know, if you're going to, if you're going to be a purple belt, you've got to be able to compete at a purple belt level. You know, Kendo is a perfect example. You know, Kendo, um, in order for you to compete, you know, your, your grade is generally in the world, anywhere you go in the world, generally a Godan or Yondan is a, a, a Yondan Godan, you know, generally. So there's, there's a very strong, um, grading, um, quality of, of, of people. Um, so there are benefits, I think, to larger organizations that really focus on that. Um, but some organizations focus more on the knowledge and the transmission of technique and, and, uh, and kuden, you know, the, the, the hidden teachings, um, that you're issued, you know, a, a license or, a, a Don rank. Um, so it's, it's all different. So yeah, to, to your point, I, I think that let's just forget about it and train, you know, just enjoy. <laughs> just forget about it just, and train. Yeah. That should be a t-shirt. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Love it. So what's coming next? As you as you look out, you know you, you you've got a birthday coming. It sounds like I mm. just turned forty two last week. Oh, so, happy birthday! You know we're we're, we're are, oh, you're also a Gemini. <laughs> I am. I am. I am. Nice, nice. What, what's what's your date? Uh, eighteenth. Friday. Okay. Yeah. So ten days. I got ten days on you. Oh, uh, awesome. Nice. So as you look out, you know, it tends to be a time of reflection as as we near our birthdays. Mm. And you look out as you, you know, at, at 45 and 50 and 75 and mm. however far you choose to look into the future. Sure. Do you have goals? Uh, great question. Are there things you're hoping to work towards, accomplish, uh, be known for, or even as simple as be able to say? Yeah. You know, it could be, you know, one of the more common answers is, I just want to keep training. So I'm kind of going to take that one away from you. In, yeah, in I, I, yeah. I, I don't, I don't think, you know, I, I think it's like, I hope I survive that. One. That's, <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's a great goal. That's number one. Let's, that's, let's, that's, 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 that that's, the, that's the number one goal. Um, you know, I, I have a lot of, you know, professional goals. Um, I, and I definitely, I, I'm, I'm always goal oriented. Uh, and I think you need to be, I think you need to have something to, to reach for, whether you reach it or not is up to you is, you know, leave it up to fate, but the journey I think is the most important thing. Um, so for, for, um, for me, you know, I want to see my students grow. I want to see them get you know, better than I am or, you know, really just try to, you know, strive and try to give what I've learned to them and them to take it on to the next level. Um, I think, I think that is the ultimate goal for me. Um, and, and like I said, you know, you could, you asked the question before, like, you know, did you ever want to stop? Yeah, definitely. Of course. But what keeps you going? What keeps that that uh that drive moving forward and it's 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 your students you know um i'm hoping one day my i can teach my son to to train and uh continue that on uh so yeah i i think it's very based on you know my goal is to continue to train of course but with the goal in mind of being able to pass on what i've learned and continuing to learn while doing that that's that's really the the uh what I find to be really important. Nice. I'm, I'm right there with you. I completely agree. If people want to find you, 
website, social media, email, anything like that you can share? Sure, sure. Um, website is uh, www.nycbudo.com. And, um, you know, that was originally a site. You know, when, when I started it up, I had a, uh, I had a dojo in uh, Queens, New York. And uh, I co-founded a, uh, a kendo dojo in Queens as well, along with my long-term friend, Morgan Hooper. And, um, and then I was teaching on Long Island at another dojo. So that was kind of the hub for all those schools together. And, uh, I was kind of using that as, as a draw to, to, uh, you know, if people were interested in training in Queens at a kendo school, they could go there. Or if they were interested in Long Island, they could go there. Um, but you know, when, when, uh, you know, we end up moving, kids get into the, to the works, you know, careers have more responsibility. Um, I found myself you know, teaching at, at one place and practicing at one place now, which has been wonderful. Um, but a lot of those things have been taken over by other teachers now and, uh, they're continuing, which is, which is fantastic. So, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, and that still remains the, the hub for that. So while I'm not actively teaching at some of those schools anymore, they can still go. Yeah. Well, this is where we, in a moment, we're going to roll out to the outro that I'm going to record after we're done here. But so this is, this is your kind of final block to speak to the audience hey. you know do you have some some words of conclusion or advice spirited challenge or something <laughs> like that that you want to leave them with uh, as we as we fade here um good question uh i think like we said in the beginning if, if you if you start martial arts um yeah and it might it might take a few different places to find the right teacher but when you do don't stop keep fighting through the pain physical and mental and um you know it's something if you find some joy whatever joy in it um keep working at that and keep trying to, to find that and try to let that seed grow because the more you do it um the more love you might find for it and on top of that you might be helping somebody else in their quest as well so uh i think that's an important thing to kind of think about when you're training it's not always about you it's about others as well well there you go you're still here so you heard it you know what i'm talking about this was an awesome episode matt it didn't matter where i tried to go matt followed me he went there with me and and took what i gave him and it was an awesome experience. I hope he enjoyed it half as much as I did. And I hope you enjoyed it even a quarter as much as I did. Guess got it. Guess comes first, right? <laughs> Seriously, though, uh, Sensei Matt, thanks for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. And I, I hope we get to connect. You, listener, go to whistlecakemartialartsradio.com. Sign up for the newsletter. Check out the stuff we got there. Go to whistlecake.com. Check out the stuff we've got there. Find a way to support us. Because if you value this show, we, we've, we've got to do stuff. We've got to do stuff. You got to help us out. Please. You want the best free option? Send this or another episode to somebody that trains and say, hey, I want you to listen to this episode and here's why. If you want to go a little di- little bit deeper, help us, you know, pay some bills. Patreon.com slash Whistlekick or Whistlekick.com podcast 15 or Whistlekickprograms.com. You can grab our speed development program. Get faster. In a few weeks, you'll go into training and people go, what is going on? Why are you so fast? And you say, well, you know, it's a secret, but I'll tell you, whistlekickprograms.com. And if you don't like it, seriously, I'll give you your money back. Personally. I will personally hand you the money. No, I'll probably mail you a check. All right, I'm getting silly. So let's wind up here. Thank you all. Thanks for your support. If you have feedback, topic, guest suggestions, anything like that, email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Our social media is at whistlekick. And that closes up another episode. We got another one coming for you soon. So until then, train hard, smile, and have a great day. 